welcome you to another of our ongoing discussions on the Old Testament. I'm Paul Hoskison of the Department of Ancient Scripture, and joining me today are three of my friends and colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture. To my left, Kelly o D. Kelly Ogden. Across the table from me, Eric Huntsman. And to my right, Michael Rhodes. Welcome. We will be discussing today the Book of Psalms. Uh, we are saving for another discussion, another time, the uh, Messianic uh, Psalms. So today we'll be discussing the Psalms more in general. I'd like to give a general overview of the Psalms before we launch into a more specific discussion. The Psalms are generally divided into five uh, sections. Sections 1 through 41 uh, deal mostly with Psalms of David. Psalms 42 through 72 are the Psalms of Korah and Asaph and others, including David. Psalms 73 through 89 are almost exclusively the Psalms of Korah and Asaph. Psalms 90 through 106 are mostly untitled Psalms. And then Psalms 107 through 150 are mostly psalms that have to do with the temple and with festivals and other is Israelite feasts. There are other divisions too besides these five. For instance, uh, Psalms 42 through 83 are addressed to, in the Hebrew text, to Elohim rather than to Jehovah, who is the God of most of the other psalms. Some of the psalms are prayers of thanks. Some of the psalms are hymns of praise and some of the psalms plead for relief. Now it is the nature of Hebrew poetry uh, to be quite different uh, than, than uh, the thing that we are usually used to as poetry. And we all recognize the book of Psalms as a beautiful book of poetry that has been very influential in uh, the, uh, the King James English right. version of them in uh, the formation of our own language. But let's talk a little bit more about Hebrew poetry itself. Well, we need Eric? to remember that the, the kind of poetry we read in our King James book of Psalms is not the way it would have sounded, of course, at all in Hebrew. A lot of English poetry revolves around rhyme schemes, not always, but often. Classical Greek and Latin poetry is concerned about meter, about short and long syllables and patterns of meter. But Hebrew poetry is more interested in rhythm and particularly parallelism, about thought. And so what will often happen, and you'll, you'll, you'll see this as you read it in English, a, a thought or idea will be expressed in one phrase and then restated in a second phrase. This is the most basic kind of parallelism. For instance, in Psalm 3, 1, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? That's a thought. Many are they that rise up against me. That's the same thought. That's what we call synonymous parallelism. Sometimes they contrast. In 1, 6, we have what we call antithetical parallelism, where the two are opposites. The Lord knoweth the way of the right righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So in other words, if, if, if we're reading this and we, we see a lot of what we think are repetitions. That's actually poetry. This is poetry <laughs> that's and, right. it's, and it's that way on purpose. That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh -huh. uh, there are a couple other kinds of parallelism. In the first two verses, we have thoughts that build upon each other, what they call synthetic parallelism. So you have the first verse, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. That sounds like it's just synonymous parallelism. But the next verse builds upon it. Not only does he not do that, he does something even better. He delights in the law of the Lord. And so these ideas will build. Or sometimes they'll bring in metaphors or images. One of my favorite ones is Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As the heart, or the deer, panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. So we've got this wonderful image. And then it continues, my soul thirsteth for God. So it's, so that's what we call emblematic of, parallelism. It's lovely. So there's a lot of imagery in the Psalms also then. <clears throat> now, Kelly, aren't there sometimes other kinds of patterns with... Uh, there's some things that we're not even familiar with, uh, like uh, what we call acrostic. Um, turn to a couple of the 111 and 112, for instance, are perfect acrostics. That is, the, in Hebrew, there are 22 lines, and each line begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Of course, this is something that's completely lost in our English. Yes, language. no, you can't translate There's something no way to like that. Reproduce that in English text. Or 119 is a good example that uh, we even have the the Hebrew alphabet uh, labeling each section of this uh, acrostic poem. There are 22 groups. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. E eight verses each one, and each one begins with the next. Letter. letter of the alphabet, like the first one's under Aleph, every one of those eight lines begins with Aleph. 
and the next eight, all, they all begin with bait. All those <laughs> so verses all in, in the, the Hebrew text yeah, begin with the, a, that letter of the alphabet. It's an literary yes. device. They love to, um, to, to uh, these kind of patterns. And, and, and that's and called an acrostic. Acrostic. Okay. Now then there's something called alliteration. All right. where, uh, and we're from more familiar with this, especially with Elder Maxwell. Uh, yes. <laughs> Psalm 122 says, for example, six, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <coughs> they shall prosper that love thee. The Hebrew text actually says, Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. You, you, can, you can hear that. Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim. And they, they love to use this uh, r uh, repetitive sound. Now, the word psalm in Greek means hymn or song of praise. The, the Hebrew, I assume, means the, the same. Aramaic, right? uh, the Aramaic word tehillim means praises, but only some of them are praises, but they're all songs. I mean, this is ancient Israel's songbook. And if they were a song in ancient Israel, what would that sound like, Kelly? In, in other words, the, these are the, the, the psalms would have been used like a hymn book is uh, used today. Maybe even like the first LDS hymn book, where there were just the, the words. The text and hymn tunes, but and, no, uh, and, yes, and and no yeah. tunes to them. And that's what we have here, are the texts. I'll give you an of, example of, of one of those. Uh, 133, verse 1, a beautiful line, an excellent doctrine. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Mm. Well, that's a powerful idea, especially with our concept of atonement, at one -ment, helping bring us together. So it is a beautiful thing. That might go, uh, they might render it something like this. Hine mahatov humanahim shevet achim gam yachad. Hine mahatov humanahim shevet achim shevet achim gam yachad. Something like that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have the music, but uh, we do have the lyrics. Well, of course, the, some of the some of the texts, the psalms, have become our songs, yes. hymns today. I mean, the Lord is my shepherd. In our hymn book, we have arrangements yes. of it. I uh, I love to use the psalms for devotional purposes for that very reason. Just as singing a hymn brings the spirit into a meeting or into our personal worship. I find sometimes if I'm hard, having a hard time getting focused for my personal prayers, if I will read some psalms aloud, yes. it focuses me. Uh, I love this passage in connecting with song in 104.33. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. And we sing in all of our meetings. Some of us love to sing, and so this really touches us. But even if you're not a singer, you can read these beautiful psalms and feel the Spirit, and they can focus it's you on the Lord. Saints, I, we don't usually use this book as much as some other Christians do. They only have the Bible. We have the Book of Mormon, all right. this other scripture that we study, but, but there's some strength and power and, and uh, consolation, peace, uh, mm -hmm. joy uh, expressed in these Psalms there we is could a, use There more. is a good reason why they were included in our Old Testament. That's these right. Are, are wonderful and the, the, this is the book most quoted <clears throat> In the, in the New Testament. Well, it's our well, longest book. What are those book. figures, it, um, uh, Michael? 283 direct citations from the Old Testament in the New Testament. 116 of them come from Psalms. And the Savior treated them as, as scripture, scripture, as doctrine. As and, and at one point he, he says, I'll, I'll tell you what your law says, and he quotes from one of the Psalms. Not so, from the Torah, not from not, the first five not, books. No, he's hmm. quoting from the Psalm and calling it the law, yes. But when you think about consolation, I just have to come back to that. You know, how many people of whatever denomination, Christian or Jew, dying on a battlefield, or some of these horrible, these people who were involved in 9-11, they said, the Lord is my shepherd. It's you know, so or, or I think of Psalm 35, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. morning. Wonderful poetry. One, one uh, particularly, uh, I think, relevant passage comes in Psalm uh, 46, the, the phrase we're familiar with, be still and know that I am God. President Hinckley uh, uh, talked about uh, that, that period when he uh, was, you know, the only really functional counselor in, in the first presidency and asking the Lord, why, Lord, 
is is this happening? Why why is your prophet incapacitated? And this very phrase out of Psalms came to him: "Be well, still and know that I am God." And you have it in one twenty one, section one twenty one, don't sure. you? I mean, the same Lord gave the same poetry, poetry. to the prophet Joseph Smith. Exactly. Yes. Let's give an example of uh, or the most famous of all of them is Psalm twenty three, for example. Uh, uh, Eric is in the Tabernacle Choir. You sung this a number of times uh, with uh, full accompaniment. I, years ago, I was in the Mormon Youth <coughs> Chorus too, and and uh, we sang this in nationwide broadcasts with full chorus and full orchestra. But I've never felt the power of these words like in the Shepherd's Fields, the, or, the original setting where the, David says, "The Lord is my shepherd." See, that's what he was out there doing, taking care of the family's bank account, the the, the sheep and goats. But the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Anybody who's been to that land, especially for a half a year where it looks very dry, would appreciate green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. Water is life in that part of the world. And, and it's not the rushing torrent that you no. get in the rainy season. Where <laughs> when you, you're having you a flash flood in the water. Water. No, you don't want that water. You want the still water, yes. He, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths. There's so many little <laughs> goat trails and all, but the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that out there around Bethlehem, which are still shepherds' fields to this day, there are lots of little uh, wadis, is what they call them in that part of the world, little dry uh, gullies. valleys, gullies. Uh, when the sun starts setting in the west, it casts long shadows there. And David is saying, I will fear no evil, the valley of the shadow of death, for thou art with me. And what kind of evil is out there? Well, we know he had to deal with a lion and a bear, which were in that land anciently. Uh, in fact, the bear is all the way up to the 20th century, but no more. But there were dangers out there, but he says the Lord is his protection. This, this psalm is, in Hebrew, is only about 53 words. Mm. In English, it's longer. In, in all the translations, it's longer, but there are no adjectives even used in this psalm. I, I, every word, <laughs> there's such concrete image. Uh, the dignity and power by this, the sparing use of adjectives. They were masterful writers, but using the imagery from the land. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, some of the psalms aren't as beautiful, though. I mean, we focus on the ones that are of praise or of peace or of consolation, but there are a number of songs where David says, Lord, slaughter my enemies, curse them. They're called <laughs> imprecatory psalms. And, and, you know, for a lot of people, they'll look at Psalm 7, for instance, um, and the Lord is asked in verses 11 through 17 to just smite the enemy and may all these bad things happen. And some people say, how can this be the kind of prayer we should have? And some of the ways people try to understand these are that they focus on the Lord's righteous judgment. It's the Lord doing the punishing. It's the Lord doing the cursing. It's not us. It's someone who, the Lord who has judgment, the right to judge, and he's righteous with it. It shows his power over the wicked that they will be called to account. And then in Psalm 83, 16, he sees um, the psalmist, I don't know, let's see if it's David there or not, but the psalmist sees this as a way to bring people to repentance. After cursing them for the whole psalm, he says, fill their face with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord. So even those psalms that don't seem as usual to us, they're all tied up with the Lord and his presence in the lives of his children. And, and that's why they're so powerful to me. They're all directed to the Lord. The Lord is presence. Their prayers, their songs. That's what hymns are. A right. hymn means something that we direct to the Lord himself. There are a lot of them associated with the temple. Right. They love their, their holy temple. A, a number of them talk about lifting up the hands to, in thy name. Yeah, let's, and, just, uh, let's just read one or two of those. 27.4, I love this one. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. The Doctrine and Covenants tells us that in the ordinances of the temple, the power of God is made manifest. That's where you see the beauty of the Lord, when you understand yes. who he is and what our relationship and is to him. Inquiring in the temple. That passage, by the way, was quoted at the dedication of the Mount Timpanogos Temple. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go on to, uh, uh, to uh, Psalm 42. I think, uh, Eric, you were going to say something about Psalm 42 also, and then we'll...
We'll turn to uh, two other psalms. In the yeah, time 42 and 63 go nicely together. I've already actually mentioned the opening lines of 42 as an example of this what we call emblematic or symbolic parallelism. Y you know, as you try to find ways to make your own religious practices more meaningful and more deep, the psalms really play into here. In our family, we like to use Psalm 42, the beginning, and part of Psalm 63 as part of our fasting. When we open a fast and close a fast, we read some of these passages. For he read this, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God and for the living God. In Psalm 63, it talks about how, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee particularly when you have small children and you're trying to explain why fasting is making them feel closer to the Lord. And you can read this and say, you know, the way you feel right now, sweetheart, when you're hungry is the way your spirit feels every day. Your spirit is hungering and thirsting for the Lord. And this is a way of bringing that to our attention. And so it just, uh, we have found it to be a really meaningful oh, another, way of just another, deepening another our experience. Another line about fasting, 109.24 says, my knees are weak through fasting, my flesh faileth of fatness. <laughs> Isn't that, that alliteration? But my flesh faileth of fatness. Yeah. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> one of my favorite is uh, Psalm 82, and it's uh, one of the shorter ones, only eight lines. Uh, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judges among the gods. This is setting it up. God is the judge of all the earth. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? That is, you, Israel, how long are you going to not act the way that your Lord and God does act? justly. By the way, the word selah at the end of verse 2 there, nobody really knows what the significance of the word is. It's some term kind of a musical term or a divider so or something. The accompaniment starts up, you take a yes. breath. Or so here is the, the, preparatory uh, piece. <laughs> the antithesis then to judging unjustly is verse 3, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. This is a common theme uh, of many of the Psalms, doing justice. This is what the, the rulers are supposed to be doing. Deliver the poor and the needy, rid them out of the land of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand, that is the rulers who are doing wickedly. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. They're doing things that are not right. They're, they're contrary to nature and the nature of the righteousness which is in our God. Verse 6 now, the famous part. I have said, ye are gods. The, Elo the, the term here in Hebrew is ye are Elohim. And of all you and all of you are children of the Most High. That's how you're supposed to act. That's how you're supposed to be. Now the Savior but, quotes that yes. to the Pharisees, doesn't he? Yeah, because uh, they get after him for claiming to be God. And he says, wait a minute. Your, your own Psalms say that, uh, that we are gods. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Even though you really are the children of God, because you're acting the way you are and not judging justly, you will fall like any other man and you will die like any other man. Verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all the nations. Again, going back to verse t uh, 1, there's this parallelism here between 1 and, and 8 with God being the judge of all the earth and judging righteously. I think we'd like to go on to uh, 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 Psalm 127, Michael. You have that one. If... Right. Uh, this, this, this has two things in it that uh, uh, really resonate with me. The, the first verse, of course, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Uh, if, if your life, if, if your home, if anything is not founded upon the Lord, uh, then it, it is in vain. Uh, it, it, it will not survive. And then... Um, this is kind of like uh, earlier in the, in the historical parts of the, the Old Testament where the writers are, are making it clear that the relying on the arm of flesh is not the way the Lord wants it to happen. Exactly, You're supposed exactly. to rely on the Lord. And the, the, the th uh, three final verses uh, are uh, probably my favorites in the entire psalm. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are, chil are, are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Mm. I, I, I would only uh, amend that to uh, grandchildren as well, because my, <laughs> my quiver is really getting full with, with, with my dear grandchildren as well as my children. That, that, that I think, is, is one of the most beautiful passages that, that we now have. Now, Michael, here. this psalm and several of the ones around, uh, 
maybe the rest of you Hebraeus can help me with this, but these are called songs of degrees, and I've seen other versions call them songs of ascents. I understand, were these songs that were sung as they ascended steps up to the Jerusalem and the steps, temple? Uh, yes. Steps leading up into the more sacred parts of the temple. And it's, well, it's interesting because some of the things that are talked about here, such as the relationship of us and our children, we certainly understand, perhaps better than they did under the Mosaic Law, so what the temple has to do with that. Yeah related to the temple, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Going up to the temple, by the way, that fam famous line from uh, 24, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? The hill of the Lord is, is the, the temple. temple, temple, temple. And who temple shall temple. stand in his holy place? Those are ancient re temple recommend questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the answer is, clean hands, he that heart. hath clean hands and pure heart. The hands and the heart seem to represent all of the rest of us if well, they're clean. Well, right, I mean, your hands are the things you do the heart or the thing is your motivations and your Feel. feelings, the intensive of your heart. So it covers the whole it's spectrum. Even, it's even more than that because the heart uh, it, it is used throughout the Old Testament as a, as a metaphor for your mind and your thoughts. In the ancient world, the heart was the organ of thinking, mm -hmm. and your feelings were located uh, a little lower in your, in your bowels <laughs> there. And uh, he that has a clean okay. hands and a pure heart means those who have done nothing evil physically and those who have pure thoughts right. and, and a pure mind, a clean mind. Those are the ones who can ascend to the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, we have a few other psalms that we could cover. Let's uh, we, we, uh, turn to section 80, uh, Psalm 86 here. And I think there's some wonderful things in Psalm 86 that we can talk about. This is one of the prayers of David, and he's imploring for mercy. In verses 12 through 15, we talked earlier uh, in other sessions about David and his sin, and uh, how he uh, apparently uh, tried to do uh, uh, sincere and honest repentance for his sins. And even though he lost his exaltation, he lost his exaltation. to some extent, he is going to have a place in, yes. in the kingdom to come. Uh, in uh, verse 12, uh, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forever, for great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Uh, in LDS theology, I, I think we would say, uh, yes, uh, David, having committed adultery and then trying to cover it up with murder, and, and having lost his exaltation, but not his salvation, is very grateful to the Lord for not losing his salvation, that he will be delivered from uh, outer darkness and from the, the prison of the, in the spirit world. And verse 14, O oh God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. My enemies have not set you, God, before them either. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious and long-suffering and plenteous <clears throat> in mercy and truth. I think sometimes we get the wrong idea about the God of the Old Testament, and, and David expresses it very clearly here. He is a God of love and compassion and graciousness and long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Well, while we're talking about you know, David, and, uh, Psalm 51, I think, is particularly yes. poignant yes. As, as David here is pleading uh, with the Lord, uh, feeling the, the, the sorrow for what he has done. Against thee, verse 4, only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Uh, and verse and he, 6, thou well, desirest truth in the end. Yeah, before I acknowledge that. my transgressions and my sin mm -hmm. is ever before you. Wash, in verse 2, wash me thoroughly, thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me mm -hmm. from my sin. Verse he 10. really wants that forgiveness. Yeah. Yes. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You can sense the, the, the anguish and the agony that he's going through uh, for, for what he has done. And I think we need to read verses 16 and 17, yes, too, there. Yes, very much. For thou desirest <coughs> not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken heart, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Think of the Savior's words that he fights. Exactly. Kind of broken heart and a contrite spirit. He mentions that earlier in Psalm 34, that same concept, and includes with it another uh, a one-liner, which is a, a messianic prophecy. 34. In 34, yes, verses 18 through 20. 
The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. The same concept again. You have to offer a broken heart. This is an Old Testament concept. And, sa and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's, th there it is. This is an Old Testament concept. Well, you can help with the Hebrew on that, but I know our English word <laughs> comes from some Greek and Latin roots. That contrite, it rubbed down, broken down, smashed. It's when you been put through it all. A bruised spirit. That's right. Be humbled, yes. mellowed. Mm -hmm. And in verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Yes, none of us are spared any of the afflictions. But now verse 20, this is just a short messianic touch there at the end of this. He, that is God, keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. I know we're going to uh, deal with messianic prophecies in another session, time, but, but it's interesting he who is God has been through these sufferings too and hence can comfort us. And we've talked about David singing his penitence, uh, but sometimes the things we suffer aren't the result of our acts. And so we've got a lot of these psalms that are called laments, where he just laments what's going on around him. Uh, a session or two ago, we talked about Absalom rebelling against David and, and all the heartache and disappointment David suffered in his personal life. Psalm 3, right at the beginning, we have one of these psalms where he just pours his heart out to the Lord. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. And, and he acknowledges that no one can help him but the Lord. And I can't help but think of 2 Nephi 4, it falls in this tradition. Yes. We, often call it we call it the Psalm of Nephi. Nephi. Yes. And he does the same thing. The pe his family's gathered against him. He's suffered the loss of his father. He's concerned about his own sins. We don't particularly know what they are. And he expresses it poetically and probably, as Kelly showed us, vocally yes. through song in a way that, you know, sometimes we say that music speaks for the soul. It can, it can convey more from the soul or the spirit than just the mere words themselves do. It adds the feeling and the depth as well as the thought. These psalms are a very integral part of our uh, English heritage from the King James Bible. They're beautiful, they're poetic, and in addition to that, they speak many wonderful gospel truths and eternal truths and teach us about who we are and where we come from and what we're to be doing here on the earth. Thank you for your discussion and help today, brethren. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.